I don't know if Paulina and Martha had a chance. Oh. Uh, yeah, so if Paulina and Martha uh, had a chance to read your bio, but it's very interesting. So I just, I'll just go through it. So you're a senior lecturer and course leader in bioveterinary science. And uh, you're a student at the Anglia Ruskin University, Faculty of Health, Education, Medicine, and Social Care. And your thesis is on the experiences of course leaders in small specialist higher education institutes. Is that HEI? I wasn't sure what that, what yes. AEI was in the UK. Uh, so I'd like to ask you later, what does that mean? You, you, re you research your own job uh, and you Pretty use- much. yeah. <laughs> you use, I research you use my own job. You use Glaser's Grandi theory as your methodology, and so you're your qualitative insider researcher and science background. Uh, yeah, so that's an interesting mix. That's uh, wow, very impressive and and very quirky, shall we say? So it used to be. yeah. All right, so take it away. I, I think Helen's joining us, but uh, Helen, if you're on, welcome. We just started. Uh, Hello, everyone. Yeah. Hi, Helen. Hi. Thanks. Nikki, would it help if we just gave you a bit about uh, a one liner of what our interests are? Yes, please. And okay, I'll, 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 I will get my screen shared and all right. that sort of stuff. Okay, so uh, so I am. Uh, we are all, I can say, from Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. I'm in the second year uh, program. I'm uh, awaiting to uh, send off my proposal. My research base. My research is on uh, palliative approach to care in hemodialysis. So that's where that's where I am. I can go next. Um, so I'm Martha. I actually live in the States. And um, it's nice to have a fellow Brit on the community of practice. <laughs> and um, we are all uh, the three of us are nurse, uh, nurse practitioners. also. Yes. So uh, my interest is in the development of capability in nurse practitioner practice and education and I'm planning to do, um, I think, a, um, a hybrid concept analysis incorporating a scoping review and then a phenomenography study looking at capability um, using nurse practitioner prescribing of medication for opioid use disorder as an exemplar. Um, so that's where I'm at. Still in the week a little bit, but getting closer. Hi, Nikki. My name is Paulina. Um, so my, my background, I'm a nurse practitioner as well, like Martha and Trevina. Um, my research interest is more on the global health spectrum of things. So I'm looking at health seeking behaviors of people living with diabetes in Liberia, which is in West Africa, um, using critical hermeneutics as my methodology. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, so I do have an interview guide that I've developed. I'm also using photo voice as, as one of my data collection methods. And so it's quite trying to fit it all together in, in some way or form. Um, I'm sort of at the close-ish to my proposal defense, just trying to figure out the timing and everything else. So, um, but yeah, so with this interviewing the self and I'm really interested to see uh, possibly if we can incorporate this in our COP um, once we all get to that part so we can we can help each other out by basically interviewing, give, giving each other our guides to interview ourselves to see if we can gain anything from that. So that's really my interest. So thanks for coming. I guess I'm the next in line. <laughs> <laughs> Helen Obilo, I am an international student from Nigeria. I am a registered nurse and also a lecturer at the Department of Nursing University of Ibadan. I am in my 40th year and um, hoping to see if I can finish by December. It looks dicey. <laughs> uh, so far, I have completed a scoping review, uh, manuscripts developed and sent, and I've completed revision. So, believing it might be accepted, um, just waiting for a final decision. I'm also working on um, still recruiting participants for my main um, study, which focuses on evaluating the feasibility of using social media to engage people who have diabetes in prevention of diabetic food causes. 
to, to date, I'm doing a preliminary analysis of data collected so far, and the intervention and the result is positive, showing that uh, this social media is a feasible alternative and could help participants to improve their adherence to food self-care recommendations. Thank you. Sounds like a nice mix of a variety of things, which is always quite nice and it helps with interesting discussions, I guess. Um, right, in that case, um, I'll briefly um, introduce myself because um, Javine have already given a, a brief bio, but yes, so I'm um, a senior lecturer um, in um, what used to be called an agricultural university. We now call ourselves land-based university. Um, and I teach uh, bioveterinary science. My background is um, uh, veterinary nursing and evidence-based veterinary medicine. So um, I'm an evidence-based methodologist. Um, and I'm also a, a course leader. So I have written and now currently lead the um, undergraduate and postgraduate degree in bioveterinary science um, at Rittle. Um, and I'm then, um, a, Doctor of Education students and MD student at Anglia Ruskin. I'm currently in my fourth year out of six. Um, and um, I'm there effectively, as we already said, I'm basically researching my own job because what we find is that there is um, um, very little out there um, on how course management or course leadership in, in the UK or in Australia, for that matter, how that works. It's, it's a really um, an odd thing. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been a very interesting journey so far. Um, and because I'm, I've got my, my I'm, I stand in two caps. I'm a bioscientist. I'm a quantitative researcher by training and by experience. Um, I've been in quantitative research for the past nearly 15 years now um, and then for the past four years I've also been a qualitative researcher and as you can imagine that comes with quite a significant amount of friction um, and that friction is usually very frustrating um, but sometimes very productive so part of, of that friction resulted in in the thing that we're going to be talking about today so um, just as a, a bit of a background to this presentation um, I've kind of aimed for it to be about um, about 45 minutes um, of interactive discussion rather than me talking at a screen. Um, I am a lecturer by training after all, we don't like just talking at screens. Um, because effectively we get more out of these things if we can all just have a sensible conversation about stuff rather than me proclaiming to be an expert on something that I've quite literally invented six months ago. Um, so we're going to go from there. Um, I'm coming at this from a grounded theory perspective, but considering that grounded theory is just another way of doing qualitative research, as far as I'm concerned, um, everything that I'm saying this evening for me, I'm guessing this afternoon for you guys, um, is pretty much applicable to whichever flavor of qualitative research or even hybrid research that you're doing. Um, and and I'll, I'll explain in a little bit why that is. So um, we'll move on. So um, as we already said, so my research project focuses on um, how course leaders in a small specialist um, um, university or higher education institution experience um, using evidence um, for their course leadership role. Um, so course leaders are those academic staff that um, uh, manage programs of study. Okay, so they'll probably, um, for your context um, um, in Canada and the US, they'll probably be called differently um, because you've got entirely different um, higher education systems. But for us, this is normally um, an academic who has the additional responsibility of looking after the running of um, courses, or not courses, I'm guessing, because uh, in your case, there will be programs. So what we call a course, is I guess for you guys in terminology, a program of study. So what uh, uh, for us, the, the individual components of a course we call modules. Okay, so for example, um, in my bio degree, um, I've got a module in um, 
uh, veterinary microbiology and I have a module in immunology and I have a module in parasitology. All those modules together make a course that is a Bachelor of Science in Bioveterinary Science. Okay, so that's what we call a course. I guess you guys call it a program of study or something along those lines. Um, so I'm an academic who looks after a collection of those, um, of those courses um, on top of my normal role as a lecturer and researcher. Um, and my particular context is that I work in a small specialist institution. So we are not a large university. We are a, a, a small university of about a thousand students um, in a specialist environment. So in the UK, there are only four specialist agricultural university or agricultural um, small specialists. And we are one of four. And normally you find things like agriculture um, as a faculty of a bigger university. Um, our whole institution focuses on what a faculty does in the bigger universities. Um, we very much um, focus on applied research rather than um, uh, theoretical research and, and the kind of blue sky research. It's all very applied, industry led, industry sponsored. Um, but still with the, the very rigor of um, uh, BSCs, MSCs and PhD there. Um, so that's kind of the, the context of where I sit as a researcher. And what I found by doing my job is that I kind of I had no idea why I did the things I was doing the way I did them, how others did them, how others in the country did them. And when I started looking at this and, and I did my um, what you'd call like your, your mandatory literature review when you started the, a doctoral program, you've been told you need to do a literature review. Um, I actually found that um, there is very little evidence around how course leadership happens. What I did find is that um, in 1992, there was a national commission, uh, a, a higher education commission in the UK who did some work on course leadership. Um, and they did some research and they talked to a bunch of course leaders and the, the problems they found in 1992, um, at the time of publishing, it was 2018. So what I found as existing problems in 1992 was exactly the same in 2018. So over all that time, course leaders have been experiencing the same issues and nothing really happens. And then every, every so often, every three to four to five years, you find that someone does some research around course leadership and then it goes a bit dead and then it, someone does a bit again. Um, and that kind of is a, a bit of a pattern that we're in, but all of that research focuses on how course leaders in large universities work. Nobody actually has looked at, so we know that large universities are different from small specialist institutions. So how does that affect the course leadership role? There is this big gap of practice evidence um, that I'm now currently trying to start filling up. Now, because there was nothing there, um, I intuitively landed on grounded theory as a method slash methodology for my research, um, heavily influenced by my supervisor, who is a grounded theorist herself. Um, so kind of goes without saying. Um, so that's kind of where the, the background from the from the project sits. Um, and if we then expand that slightly, so as I already said, I'm a course leader and a senior lecturer. I'm an um, evidence-based practice methodologist. Um, so these kind of things, um, they make me very much, if you look at this, the spectrum of insider to outsider researcher, if you've got on the one side, you've got the insider research, and on the other side, you've got, you're an outsider researcher. And, and we know that that is kind of a, a fluid thing. You're never entirely insider, you're never entirely outsider, uh, depending on how you define being an insider researcher but I very much consider myself an insider researcher because I do research in my own institution um, where my course leader colleagues are my participants that I'm interviewing um, these are colleagues with more and less experience which comes with therefore some some um, uh, interesting um, developments but on top of that I also deliver um, evidence-based practice staff development sessions for academics in my institution because I'm an um, evidence-based practice methodologist by background. Um, so because my research focuses on how course leaders use evidence to inform their role, I'm therefore also an, on an additional level an insider researcher because I'm the person that delivers evidence-based practice training to people who I'm going to ask 
how do you use evidence in your role? So it's a really interesting um, dynamic um, that then further down the line led to me questioning um, how I can address that in a grounded theory context. Okay. Um, in a degree, I'm an outsider researcher because I'm doing a doc doctorate at an external institution. And I am also the only qualitative researcher in my whole institution. So the whole of Brittle University College is quantitative because we are an applied science institution. So I am the only qualitative researcher. And I'm not even a real qualitative researcher because at the same time, I'm still a quantitative researcher as well. So I'm half a qualitative researcher, if you will. Um, so that's kind of where the research checks, where the project sits, how I fit into these things. Um, so now you know a bit more about me and how this project has come to be. Um, what I wanted to do this evening is I wanted to focus on the following things. I want to focus on what quality means in qualitative research. And I don't mean the quality from the qualitative aspect of that, but how do we know that we do good quality research? Um, then I came at this from a, so how, what was quality in a grounded theory context? And by extension, because grounded theory is qualitative research, we look at this from a slightly broader perspective. So what does quality mean in a, um, in a grounded theory and a qualitative research? We'll do it in one go. Um, and then we have to have a brief look on how quality is affected when you do grounded theory research. So what things affect quality in grounded theory research? And then we can have a discussion of how this works for your particular methodologies and, and other ologies. Um, and then we'll move on to how the concept of interviewing the self and the practice of interviewing the self can be a useful tool to support or enhance the quality of the research that you're doing. And then finally, we'll, we'll finish on a practical note as to, all right, now we've talked about why this could be a useful thing. So how do we do it? And that very much comes from my experience. How have I done it? Okay, and that's the only way I can talk about it because as I said, I only thought about this six months ago. So if we think about quality and qualitative research, then there are a lot of definitions and a lot of takes and a lot of ways of looking at quality. But what I, because of my preconceptions and my background as a bioscientist and as a veterinary scientist, um, I very much look at quality in qualitative research as the thing that determines um, how useful your research is for other people. Okay, and if we then look into what the, the literature surrounding that, there's a, a very nice paper by Gesson um, who, um, 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 who discussed that quality in qualitative research is determined or the quality of a project or the quality of a piece of research is determined by trustworthiness and by its rigor. So how trustworthy is research and how rigorous is that, has that research been done? So we then need to have a bit of a think about, okay, so what does trustworthiness mean? Now trustworthiness is um, um, the, the soundness or the conceptual soundness, because qualitative research, as you know, is all about the, the, the conceptualizing of, of your, your findings. Um, the conceptual soundness, which allows you to, to evaluate um, the value of the research. So how valuable is that research to the wider community, other people, other researchers, um, and, and to our field of study? Okay, what, how valuable is that? And, and that value or, or that trustworthiness comes with four elements. Okay, um, it talks about credibility. Okay, so does the data that we generate reflect the findings? And are the findings based on the data that was collected? It goes both ways, okay? Um, and this is where researcher influence also comes into play. How is a researcher, do you influence the data and how does that then influence the findings? Okay, and this is something to keep in the back of your mind because this is where we, we later, um, we, we use this as a little hook, okay? Um, we talk about transferability, how well does your theory or your outcome or, or your conclusion, how well does that transfer to another context? Mm -hmm. Then dependability, can this process be confirmed? Okay, 
how do we know that you've done it right? How can we know that, that there is uh, that, that your, your research is dependable? What have you got that can confirm the process that you followed? <clears throat> and then finally, we look at confirmability. Okay? Can someone else get a similar outcome when given the same data set? So if you take, so suppose you're doing interviews, okay? if you take your interviews and as your data set and you, or your transcripts rather, you give your transcripts to another researcher who is experienced with the method that you're using, will they come to a similar outcome? If that is the case, then that is confirmability. They have confirmed your findings by doing it independently. And we do the same in, in, in science. We, we use independent labs to verify findings. The situation is not that different. It's never going to be 100% the same because as we know, when you are in a qualitative research situation, the influence of the researcher is a lot bigger and there's interpretation involved and those kind of things. But you, in broad lines, should get a similar outcome when given the same data set and using the same methods and methodology. Yeah. Nikki? Uh, yes. Uh, I just wanted to ask a question. I think you are talking about confirmability, confirmability right? Yes. So I got challenged in my, in my proposal, and I don't know if I answered it properly, but um, around confirmability for my study that the question that I got was, well, in qualitative research, because, because it's a unique population, unique context for every study is different, et cetera, et cetera, um, can you really get similar outcomes? So that was that was the question, because I think I wrote in my like trustworthiness section, I talked about how I'm going to do my study in such a way that somebody else could look at it and replicate it. I think it's a replicate. Yeah. And then I got challenged with that term. I think it was a term. And it was like, well, are do you is that true? Can you can somebody else replicate another qualitative study? And I was like, hmm. but there's there's a difference between okay. replicability and confirmability. And the key lies in that last bit of that um, final sentence, when given your data set. So we're not looking at repeating the research with a different population. Okay. We're looking at, I have my data set. So suppose you do 25 interviews, you have 25 transcripts. Okay. If you take those 25 transcripts, analyze them and come to an outcome. If you mm. give that same pile of transcripts to another researcher who uses the same method and methodology, oh. in broad lines, come to the same outcome. Okay. Yes. Replicability. I that way. Okay. Mm, yeah, okay. Replicability is repeating the project again. Mm using yeah. a different population and then okay. you are then that challenge is absolutely correct because if you have a, a different population of people that you're studying yeah then you're not going to get the same answers and therefore you might come to a slightly different outcome right okay okay i see where i, where I think the language i use was inappropriate okay um, it's just a final the, the final detail and, and the, particularly with the confirmability because i struggled with this in my proposal defense um, okay. the 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 particular the the um, the detail is is important here is the element of when given your data set. Okay. Because that takes away the variable that is a different population. Right. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. That's very clear. Yeah. It's really helpful. And I was going to just add that, you know, as I'm reading about phenomenography, one of the ways that is recommended to sort of confirm your research is to do exactly that and to have more than one person analyzing the transcripts. Now, I'm not sure how I'm going to do that. I was going to say that works until you're a doctoral student and then right. it work. Exactly. <laughs> um, but then that's the difficulty of doing doctoral research. You have to find creative ways around it. But I mean, we see the same issue with the thing of transferability. So you have generated an outcome. In my case, there's going to be a, a substantial theory um, as, a, as an outcome of my grounded theory research. Um, in other cases, there might be um, themes, there might be um, um, particular outcomes, but you've done those particular outcomes using a data set generated by you and a group of people. Now, transferability does not mean that transferring this to another context and it's going to mean the same thing 
okay, because we're not looking at quantitative science. It's not that we're, okay, so we're doing this particular project in, um, in 10 golden retrievers, and now we're doing it in 10 beagles, and we're going to get similar findings. Okay? That's not the, the key thing. It's just, it's a measure of how well does your theory, independent of space and time, transfer to a different context. Okay, because it, the key is in this, the conceptual soundness. So trustworthiness is around conceptual soundness. It's not the literal way. It's, it's about conceptualizing your stuff. And concepts can be transferred to a different context. Even uh, though okay. the actual findings might be slightly different. But because you're looking at this from a conceptual angle, concepts can be transferred. In, in oh. a grounded theory perspective, would it be like, so I've, I've generated this substantial theory but the, the point of a grounded theory is that it's independent of time, space, and context, so that we can transfer it to a different context and still apply that theory. And if you conceptualize properly, then you should be able to transfer it to a different context. If you don't conceptualize properly, then you use too much of your direct influence of your participants and that sort of stuff, and then transferring becomes difficult. So uh, conceptualizing so, is important. Oh. So Nikki, can I ask you in terms of the transferability, would this be uh, what you're talking about? So in my, in my research, uh, palliative care has usually traditionally been focused on cancer care, right? It, it, it came out of that, out of the, the UK uh, in the 60s. So in terms of say pain management or approach to, uh, I'm just making this up, pain management in oncology or I can transfer that to nephrology, which is my my specialty, kidneys. Like it's still palliative care, but the approach to pain management and oncology could potentially be parlayed to be transferred to uh, nephrology, kidney care. Would that be? Uh, See so if I come yes, up with a theory. I, I think so. I mean, because because you, you're thinking about this. If you look at this from a from a conceptual perspective, you're not no longer having the direct findings, but you're making it, a, and this is really difficult to explain, but you're making this a, a conceptual thing and the concept of pain management in your case, it doesn't matter what, where that pain, what causes that pain. The concept of pain management is that you make the pain manageable or take it away. Now you can apply that to a variety of contacts, mm -hmm. to, to a variety of environments. So do you have any thoughts about, it's a, sort of related, like how we, how one frames that in terms of, um, you know, it, it, making the argument that your research it is going to be transferable, there must, the, the, by necessity, you have to put some boundary around where you're going to transfer it to, otherwise it's meaningless, right? So in your case, maybe to another HEI that is a specialist institution, but maybe not to a large university with multiple colleges i mean or or <clears throat> within the subject i'm just wondering how we frame that i think when i when i wrote my uh, my proposal um i although i made a distinction between large universities and small specialists i made the argument that the the theory if conceptualized properly can still be applied to larger universities or to universities in different countries because every university independent of where they are has a person looking after students on a course and that person will have struggles and they might find value in the concepts and oh yeah i identify with those, those concepts they resonate with me my context is different but i can still find that valuable um, to a degree, I might even see that if we take this one, one step further, um, I am, in effect, a middle manager in a university. My findings of using evidence in my middle management role, the, the conceptualized version of that might well, be, um, 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 might well be useful for someone who's a middle manager somewhere in a, a, in a company, I don't know, in, in insurance company because you're still in a middle management type role. So what you've really done, I mean, you're really breaking down your role then as a middle manager, as a, somebody in charge of a course, and yeah. 
and and that's where the transferability is happening oh yeah i would so say that's so kind yeah. of what we need to do um i'm not saying that's what you need to do but that's how i did it and that's how i got through um but it's important to make that argument that because in the end what what you're going to have to argue to get a project approved is that it meets um the requirements of a doctoral project that you meet that doctorateness and in the uk we have very well defined um characteristics of what doctorateness mm. means which i've got at the end of this presentation um but there is things like a contribution to knowledge yeah and at the same time don't overthink it because this sounds very condescending but it's only a doctoral project yeah you're not after a nobel prize if it is meaningful for someone then you've done your job and then you have a contribution to knowledge um and i think particularly because you guys are working in a health context that being meaningful to someone is a lot easier to prove than it is for me in a higher education context blabbing about how course managers make decisions yeah um but yeah so don't take the transferability too lit too literal as in right these are my findings and they are going to be the same for this different environment now you talk about what were the concepts that I found and how do they transfer across? You, you're thinking on that one level higher than your direct findings. Um, right, so that was trustworthiness. So we briefly look at um, rigor, particularly for grounded theory, um, because there's some, some bits there and, and they all overlap. So um, in grounded theory, we say that um, um, there's a couple of definitions of rigor. So originally Glazer in, in 92 said that a rigor in grounded theory is determined by um, fit, so how well does the theory fit um, for, by work, by relevance, or how relevant is the theory? Can it be modified? Because one of the aspects of grounded theory, substantial theory, is that over time, when new material is generated, um, theories can be modified. They are not set in stone. They are meant to be modifiable. Um, and then we talk about parsimony and scope. Um, now, Gasson talks about rigor as um, confirmability, dependability, authenticity, and transferability. So that very much overlaps with the trustworthiness aspect. And then um, Cooney mentions um, credibility, auditability, and fittingness. How well does your theory fit? How credible is it? So how useful is it to other people? And the auditability aspect of this, I think, in the current day and age of research and science is incredibly important. Um, how clear has our process been? Yeah, not just from a doctorate angle, but from an ethical angle and a research transfer, a transparency angle. Um, if someone questions you, okay, so how did you generate that code or where did that theme come, came from or come from? If you have a proper audit trial through your research, in grounded theory, that's a combination of memos and other things. Um, in, in, in various other research, it can be the notes you take and you know all those kind of things. Um, you need to be able to show how you came to your findings. That's, that's auditability and that is um, an indicator of rigor. Now, what I did is a, a, in a methodology paper that I wrote for my doctorate, um, I merged all those elements because there are so many different variables, there are so many different things and, and actually they all overlap. So I've amalgamated a, a wide range of these things and I came up with a set of questions that are a lot easier to work with than the criteria described by all these researchers. So for fit and transfer, transferability and modifiability, you just ask yourself, so does the theory that I generated explain the situation? Can we use it elsewhere? And can it be adapted for future use? And if the answer is yes, yes, and yes, brilliant. Okay. Um, does the theory help explain the situation to the people involved? So does it mean something to your participants? Um, does the data accurately reflect the situation? If, if so, then that's a value of creditability and authenticity. Um, auditability is the same thing as can researchers confirm the findings when presented with the same data. Um, parsimony, um, is the theory unnecessarily complicated? In other words, no, keep it simple stupid right the simpler the better and then we talk about scope does it account for as much variation in the data as possible and this is particularly 
useful for grounded theory because we go from codes to concepts to uh, codes, categories, concepts, and then uh, uh, um, a theory. But as we go up in those levels, we, we think about variation in the data and there will always be variation in the data, but can the theory account for that? If you conceptualize properly, then yes. And then you have a rigorous and, thrust, uh, and trustworthy study. So I've amalgamated that stuff in a set of questions, um, and I've um, I'm currently it's been um, deposited as a, um, a preprint, um, and I'm working on on working this into a, a paper submission in the next couple of months. Nikki, uh, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. What if you have a negative study, and what if your grounded theory does not generate a theory? Then is it uh, a grounded theory? study if a grounded theory doesn't generate a theory then you haven't it and you need to sit from a doctoral perspective this could be slightly awkward because there's only so much research you can do but effectively in grounded theory you keep interviewing until you reach saturation right and when you reach saturation then at some point you'll end up with a th with a theory if you don't reach saturation then there's a chance that you're not going to reach that theory level but what if your results do not do not confirm your your um, uh, I don't want to call I was going to say hypothesis, but that's not what I obviously think granted theory. But what if assumptions? If sorry, what was that, Helen? Assumptions. I'm sorry, thank you. What if your results do not support your assumptions that you went into your research with? How okay. does your how how do your criteria impact that? Okay, well, let me let me answer a question with an answer then. Um, if my theory or my findings, if we if we take this slightly broader than just grounded theory into just qualitative research in, in general, if if my findings and my my overall outcome does not meet my assumptions when I started, is that a bad thing? Maybe my assumptions were not right. Fine. Sure. Yeah. It's not necessarily a bad thing. The same way that negative findings in science are not a bad thing even though everyone thinks they are, they really aren't. Um, so maybe that means that your assumptions were malinformed. Mm -hmm. Or maybe if you look at this from a- theory, from... Jovina. I feel what like was that, sorry? You might still come up with a theory, it just may not be the theory you were anticipating, but I think it would be rare if you truly have reached saturation not to come up with any theory. And, and that's the, particularly mm -hmm. the key in grounded theory is that you, go, you, you, the whole point of grounded theory is that you go into it without preconceptions. So you don't right, make right. those assumptions. Now, this is part of the issue that I have. And this is part of the reason why I came up with this interviewing the self thing. Um, because this whole going into it without preconception um, is not impossible when you're an insider researcher. Mm -hmm. now, it's not impossible for anyone because you're going into a field of study because you're interested in it and therefore you already have a certain level of preconception so you can never fully eliminate it no matter what glazer says mm -hmm. but over the years he's softened his stance a bit um and and so we're, we're coming at this so effectively what we'll bring this brings us to the, the next um slide is some of the criticisms of the grounded theory in particular how do we know that a theory is really grounded um can grounded theory really be objective? This is particularly because I'm a glazier and grounded theorist. Can it really be objective? Um, what about research of preconception? Okay, so um, glazier always says, well, you shouldn't do a literature review before you start because that will lead to preconception. Now balance that with, as a doctoral student, you're being told to do a literature review and you probably need to do one because otherwise you don't get your project approved. Yeah, so mm, doesn't quite work out. Um, and then over the years, so people have modified that stance a bit. And when I'd say, right, so doing a very detailed literature review is maybe not the thing to do, but doing a broad literature review, the broad area of your research is acceptable because that's how, that helps with sensitization and by, and, and by generating codes and categories and that sort of stuff. So what I did was I... Um, my literature review was on um, just the general aspect of course leadership in the in, in small specialist institutions. So I did a literature review on um, what is the current state of evidence surrounding course leadership. And that's where I left it. I didn't go into how do course leaderships experience their role. I didn't go into how 
uh, what, how does this work or how do they make decisions? No, I just left it as in, what do we currently know about course leadership? And that gave me my literature review. And that in itself would have not caused preconception in my case, because I am a course leader. And nothing that came out of that literature review surprised me. And therefore, it hasn't caused any preconception above and beyond what I already know as a final bullet point insider researcher. How as an insider researcher do you go into a grounded theory project without preconception? You can't. You can't just switch that part of your brain off. And that will be the same for, um, for your uh, various methods, methodologies. You, you might not have that emphasis of you can't be you, you can't have that preconception before you go into research because you'll affect the quality, blah, 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 blah. But you'll all go into your project with your life experience and your professional experience and your educational experience. Now, it's your job to figure out how that affects your research, your findings, and your interpretation of those findings. And that's part of the two last bits this is what I focus on. This is what I struggled with as a grounded theorist. Grounded theory and insider research in the first instance seem two things that cannot happen together because of the preconception element. Um, so that's why I kind of came up with strategy. This is what I struggled with. This is what I was thinking about. And then I basically went back to my basics as an evidence-based methodologist. And I was like, right, in in effect, in effect, preconception is what in evidence-based practice and in science we call bias. And bias is something that systematically um, or systemically rather affects the research project from start to finish. Yeah? Research, research bias is the systemic um, um, impact from start to finish on the research project which leads to either overinflation or under, under uh, evaluation of research findings. Now, as an insider researcher, you are a source of bias. I'm now going to call it bias rather than preconception because I see it as the same thing, but you are a source of bias because you came up with a project, you justified it. You designed the project based on your experiences and your findings and your professional background and, and how you interpret the advice that you get from people. You collect your data. So you talk to your participants. How you talk to your participants is determined by your experiences to that point. You analyze your data. It's preconception and bias there. You report your findings. How you write is affected by what you've done in your life before. And it doesn't mean that that's a bad thing. Not at all. Preconception and bias are not bad things. As long as you address them appropriately. And by that, I mean, as long as you're transparent about how they affected your research. Okay. So, again, in grounded theory, I, I see bias and preconception as the same thing. Um, so, in grounded theory, we call that preconception when you go into a project predominantly and, and when you go and, and analyze your data and form your codes all those kind of things um so what i struggled with was so how do we deal with this what what is the best way of if i can't avoid the preconception then how do i acknowledge that it's there how am i transparent about it and how do i demonstrate that i've dealt with it in an appropriate manner and that's what I struggled with. And that's how I came up with, okay, reflexivity can't be a bad thing then. Reflexive practice is uh, examining, uh, examining your own belief, judgment, practices, experiences, and how they influence your research. So reflexive research practice or reflexive practice helps develop that transparency in your research process. So as an insider researcher, reflexive analysis of, of your position in the research should explain how you 
as, as an insider researcher and as a source of bias, affect that process, affect the project, affect the finding. That's what that reflexive analysis does. Um, it therefore also enhances credibility because it talks about the quality of your research. Reflexive practice can enhance the quality. Thing is, once you recognize that reflexive practice is a good thing, how do you make this explicit and transparent? How do you demonstrate what you've done? Because generally we find that when we look at this reflexive um, um, element of doctoral work and of research, and we do this in a very narrative way, in a bit disconnected way, we, we have this chapter where we talk about a reflexive analysis of, of ourselves. But then the link to how does this affect research is something that needs to be very strong because otherwise we still can't, your readers and, and the users of your research still can't interpret how you affected the research. And in the end, the end user needs to be able to um, um, judge how valuable the research is to them and they need the full package of information to do that. Now, just as an aside, uh, reflexivity is not the same for all ground theory types. So depending on what school of grounded theory you follow, um, you might be um, more reflexive than others. So for example, Shamaz and, and, and Corbin and Strauss advocate reflexivity. Glazer says you don't need to do it because grounded theory process will deal with all these things. Um, I'm not convinced by that, which is why, although I started my doctorate as a Glazer and grounded theorist, I've slowly over time shifted and I now see myself as a pragmatic grounded theorist. I'm mostly Glazer but where I can deviate from it for good reasons and justifiable reasons, I will. Yeah. Um, so then we come to this, the purpose and practice of the interviewing yourself or the self-interview, okay? You want to ask yourself the same questions that you ask your participants because that will allow you to analyze your answers that you give to those questions through a reflexive lens which will then allow you to very critically analyze how you affect your research specifically to that project linked to your interaction with your participants and the interpretation of your findings. Um, and look at this from, a, from an insider perspective. Um, we make it very explicit and very explicitly clear how the preconception or the bias has affected the research. Um, because by asking yourself the same questions you ask your participants, if you're an insider researcher, then by looking at your answers, you can, for example, and in my case, and we'll see that in, in, the, next, um, in the next couple of slides, um, I, I came to some realizations as to where I was making assumptions of how others were experiencing their role, because that's how I experienced it. And therefore it must be the same for other people. And the only way that that came out was because I basically interviewed myself by proxy and then reflexively analyzed what came out of that. Um, I then thought, I mean, it can't be this simple. Someone must have already thought of this and started doing some research around interviewing the self. And, and currently you can really use self interview, use self interviews as a clinical tool but that's kind of where it stops. Nobody's actually ever asked themselves the same question. So I thought, okay, well, in that case, we'll take this forward and I'm gonna start developing this as a novel contribution to grounded theory. And by extension, um, a novel contribution to qualitative research in general, because I've got um, a fellow doctoral student who's done this for um, uh, IPA. So Nikki, if you think about um interviewing yourself yes as a contribution and you know in some i think in grounded theory certainly in you know in the methodology that i'm using you know as you as you conduct your interviews you then adjust your script or your interview guide mm -hmm. like would you use a self interview as a pilot kind of process to that, that would then might cause you to say, you know, I really didn't ask that question or I could ask it better or think about different ways to ask. So, I mean, would you adjust your interview guide, I guess is my question, based on your self interview? As you would no, if you I, doing a pilot interview with somebody else. No, I think what, what I would, the way I would use it and, and the way I am using it is that um, 
my own interview would explain how my adjusting came to be. So it's kind of looking at it from the opposite way. Because in the end, you, you want the research to take place, but I want to be able to understand how I came to the decisions that I came to. So how, where did this particular code or category come from? So for example, and we're going to come back to this in a bit, but I had, what I found was that I found it a lot easier to develop um, codes for negative aspects of people's roles than for positive aspects of people's roles. I struggled with the terminology, the codes for the positive aspects, but the negative ones are really easy. And then when I looked at, so what does this mean? Which negative aspects are these? And it's like, oh, but that's because they're talking about the things that I don't like about my own job. But I would have never come to that realization if I wouldn't have done this interviewing the self element. So at what point in the process, maybe you said this already, but do you do this? Is it before you conduct your uh, interviews? Is it during or after? Or wouldn't I that would, make a difference, perhaps? I did it after two, but that's just because that's, at that point, that's when I thought about it. Um, I would say probably the logical thing to do is to do it first. Because the additional element to this is, apart from all the analysis, analysis quality, yada, 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 um, suddenly you also know what it feels like to be interviewed. And then you can put yourself in the shoes of your participants, which will enhance the quality of your interview. So that's the second element that we haven't even talked about. We're not going to talk about yet because that's a separate paper that I'm working on is, uh, are you a better interviewer because you have the experience of being interviewed? I think so, because being interviewed is not a natural thing giving your thoughts and feelings about something that you're very intimately familiar with to someone else who, in my case, is a colleague, but not your friend. And if you're an external researcher, someone who doesn't even know you, that is not a natural position to be in. And you will never know what that feels like until you've been interviewed. So from that angle, it is also a good thing. And from that angle, I would say do it first because it makes you probably a more empathetic interviewer and therefore um, the quality of your interviews will be better. And then on top of that, you have the reflexive element that's linked to it. Um, but I'm doing it after two because just that's just how stuff happened to be. I wasn't well, smart enough to, wonder, to do it first. Like, would your answers change? I think they would. If you did it before uh, and then you did it after, I Possibly, but make, consider that I come at this from an insider researcher element. Um, I think they would change, but not dramatically, because how I experience my role as a course leader is not necessarily affected by the answers someone is going to give me in an interview, other than I might find things that resonate and I might find things that I don't agree with, but that is not going to necessarily um, massively influence the, the, how I experience my roles and therefore how I'm going to analyze stuff. Because particularly from, from, if you look at this, in the end, you want to conceptualize this. And once you start conceptualizing, that influence goes away. Um, and you can always, if you even if you do this like three, four, five interviews deep, and then you do it, you can always say, all oh, right, so maybe I should have asked a bit more around these themes in my day. You can always, if you have the ethical permission, you can always go back and say, oh, look, I've got some follow-up questions. Would you have to have another, another chat for 20 minutes? And then you can dive into that a bit deeper, and then you explain in your thesis why that happened, how that came to be. I don't see that as a problem. Uh, would you say that this has to be context specific? So, for example, if you're doing research on, on you know, something so as sensitive as domestic violence, so how can you manage the tension between asking the questions without, if, you, if you've never been a victim of domestic violence, how can you then say that you're, you're, you're putting yourself uh, through no. that reflexive exercise that that you know empathy and all that 
you're, you, you have an idea of what it would be like to be interviewed and to, and to answer. So how do you, how do you manage the tension between your, uh, yeah. Th there will always be specific ways when it doesn't work, but mm -hmm. then this is where the, the insider element comes into play. Mm -hmm. um, and keeping in mind that insider, outsider is a spectrum rather than a dichotomy. Um, I think if, if you've never experienced, I mean, if we use the same example, if you've never experienced domestic violence, then what does that look like? Are you then an insider researcher? Yeah, those are questions you can ask yourself. Uh, maybe you are, uh, if we look at this in a specific context, you say, suppose you, you, um, uh, you, you are researching other doctoral students um, and you, you want to know about how they experience domestic violence and you are a doctoral student yourself, then suddenly you are very much an insider researcher asking about something very specific you can then still be interviewed with your own interview schedule um, because that will still help you explore your assumptions surrounding, in this case, domestic violence. And because that's the thing, it helps you explore your assumptions and your thoughts about this, because those are the things that eventually will influence how you conduct your research. And in this case, the outcome may well be, no, I've never been through that. And therefore, how do I know that my codes, my concepts, my themes are actually reflecting what they should reflect, which then heads back to the credibility element of trustworthiness. So in a way, there are situations where it simply won't work, but there are a lot of situations where because insider outsider is, a, is, a, is, a, is not a dichotomy, um, and as a researcher, we always have to look at how we position ourselves in the research context. Um, if asking yourself the same questions, even though you've never been in that position, helps you explore your assumptions, experiences, and how they might affect your research, then it's probably a good thing. Makes sense. Thank you. Um, so practice wise, it's always best to ask an experienced interviewer to do this. Now, I think that's the case because interviewing is not an easy thing. Um, and experienced researchers have the ability to take your interview schedule, if you will, and make it their own and make that interview an effective thing and they will pick up little bits that need to be explored further because your answer isn't quite clear or there is something there that is worth exploring further or um, they they are good at this empathic interviewing thing um, but basically the, the research says that experienced interviewers interview better so if you have access to an experienced interviewer then there's a good chance that you get a better interview, but it helps with also with prediction because the one thing that's a bit difficult is if you give your interview schedule to someone else, you know what's in their interview schedule. So you might start predicting questions. Whereas if you get an external interviewer, because there are always variations in style and how questions are asked and which elements they pick at, um, that prediction element becomes a bit harder. And then um, it's easier to get your true thoughts and feelings out. Um, but eventually the whole point is that you analyze your own interview answers to explain your bias slash your preconception. Okay. Now, so for example, I've, I've finished doing this a couple of weeks ago and I found one of the things I found really helpful about it is having to explain my thoughts to someone else made it a lot easier to, after the fact, then analyze through reflexive lens because I have made explicit what I think I've put it in words 
and that made it easier to then analyze it. Whereas if you do a reflexive analysis and you just do it because of stuff that's in your head and you haven't really, you have to explain to someone, then you never, the stuff doesn't get teased out. Um, so I, I found it really helpful that in having to explain my thoughts and feelings and experiences, um, like I would ask for my participants, it was a lot easier to look at them reflexively and, and to actually with, with proper purpose consider them and, and go at them in, in great, de great detail. And uh, for example, as I said earlier, I, I realized that I was more sensitive to negative aspects that participants described because those negative aspects in a lot of cases resonated with me and that, that expressed itself in um, holding more confidently. Um, and by using certain terminology in my codes, <coughs> which in a way over time will go away because you conceptualize, but I'm the person that comes up with the terminology used for my concepts. And if I struggle more with one set of concepts than with, with another, then inevitably that will affect my research because it steers my thoughts in a certain way. Being aware that this is something that's happening means that I can address it. Yeah. Um, and I also found that be, as an insider researcher, researching my own job, that I, I had assumptions of how my colleagues would experience course leadership. Um, and then I would project those assumptions onto them by, for example, in my interview style. Because I used it very much a conversational interview style because I'm talking to my colleagues. So it was a fairly informal conversation. Um, even though I used like a semi-structured interview technique, it's still very much like a, 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 a motivational interview style because I was familiar with the people that I was talking to. But you, you don't have that um, um, subconscious way of asking questions and follow-up questions and going the, mm -hmm, yeah, yeah, that, I mean, yeah, I found this the other day. Those kind of things, um, that those are projections of my experiences of my job and having to explicitly explain that stuff to someone and then look at that after the fact made it really clear that those things actually happened and I now know what assumptions I made and then I also know for follow-up interviews that I am at least aware that these things happen and then I can hopefully try to avoid them a little bit but where they do happen I know how they're going to affect my research. So, I mean, and there's, there's other ways and other examples of looking at these things, and it will all be a bit steered by the method slash methodology that you use. But um, I think if you predominantly see this as a very transparent and, and purposeful way of doing, of analyzing uh, reflexively your position in the research, then in effect, that's all it is. But rather than saying, I've been reflexive and then coming up with a descriptive narrative, you actually have a transparent technique of doing it, which helps with auditability, which helps with credibility. Um, and therefore, um, in the end, it will enhance the quality of your research. Or it will help enhance the quality of your research. Um, so... I see this as my contribution to knowledge in this case is that we, for this particular element of my doctoral research, is um, we don't quite understand yet still how to be reflexive in grounded theory. A lot of people talk about it, but nobody tells you how to do it. Okay, so we now have a method. Um, critically analyzing that self-interview allows for reflexivity, allows for acknowledgement. Um, which is a contribution to knowledge in itself. Um, as far as Glazer is concerned, it's just another source of data. All is data, according to Glazer. Um, but all in all, it's just a very explicit method to increase the transparency of your research, which will lead to better research practice, which will lead to increased credibility, which will make your findings and your research more useful to someone else. And that's why we're doing it. What you're doing needs to be useful for other people, because otherwise it's just going to gather dust on a bookshelf somewhere. Yeah. Um, and that's it. So questions, discussion, everything along those lines. Um, thank you very much. And yeah.
talk. That that was. I feel like I was in a session. <laughs> um, a good session, but so I'm struggling with um, it, it conceptually this. I, I I'm I like you say it's a way. It's another source of, of data, right? But mm -hmm. I find myself like like how how do I express that on paper so that the person who uh, who's reading this, which you know, my committee members who may not be familiar with with who are not you know grounded theorists or or whoever whatever uh whatever what whatever methodology uh they ascribe to uh without sounding too wishy-washy like mm. not that i want to make it concrete but but you say like this is a, an emerging an emerging me um, method yeah uh, you don't it, brinkman did not write anything about self-interview to my knowledge, um, so how, do you, how, how does how does one explain it so that it is clear, it is concise, it's to the point, um, and and fulsome at the same time? Uh, what I'll do because I've of course I've had those discussions and struggles as well. Um, I will try first and foremost to stop sharing the screen for a bit because that means I can see everyone. Um, come on. Where is my share the screen button gone? Oh, there it is. There we go. Right. Um, I'm going to, I'll pull up the start of a manuscript where I started exploring ways of making this experience. So what I'm planning on doing is putting a chapter in my thesis on interviewing the self um, from a, a, a reflective, and I'm not sure what I'm going to title it yet, but it's going to be a separate chapter in my thesis. Do you want me to stop recording at this point? Uh, no, I'm happy. It's fine. You're happy? Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure how you're going to be sharing the recording, but... Um, with a small group of people that are interested. Fine with me. If, if people can make sense of my stuff, then I guess it's better for them than it is for me. Um, right. Sorry, Nikki, we should probably make a point at this point. We're a bit late in saying this, but I hope everyone's okay oh, to right. go beyond. <laughs> No, that's okay. So as long as everyone is, is okay. I will leave right now. Thank you for the time. Okay, Helen. Have a good day. Bye. See you next time. Bye. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I won't be offended if people need to leave. I'm sure you're not. I do tend to blab on on these things. Uh, right. Here we go. Craft. So. One of the things I've done, let me just share that screen again. Uh, share screen, that one. Share. Don't use Zoom very often. Right, so one of the things I've done, for example, is uh, one of the things, the ways I'm thinking of doing this is um, I'm writing this paper on, on this new method and, and then explaining it to them. Um, what I plan on doing is just use excerpts of my own interview and then underneath that put a reflexive element on that and then have another um, excerpt that demonstrates a different element of, of how my research was influenced. So for example, here um, talks about my contract of employment and how I became to be a course leader um and how not having a formal contract as a course leader affects how i do my job and then that that was how i was discussing it with the interviewer um, and then i talk about how that has affected if i look back at it how that has affected my professional identity and how that professional identity has influenced my research project um so i'm just going to analyze it the same way i would analyze any other interview transcript so as um, an insider interviewer would you um pick someone to do your interview to, to do the self-interview who's also an insider within your own field i'm just uh, trying to think about how to go about doing no, that. I, the people that are insiders for me that do my same clinical job are not researchers or interviewers. i, I used um someone who's an experience, I mean, I used an experienced IPA researcher, um, but I used them because 
I get on with them and they're an experienced interviewer. And they're not an insider in my institution. Um, they're not even in that. We yeah, we're both course leaders in different institutions and I'm a veterinary scientist and she's a mental health nurse. Um, and that's kind of where the comparison stops. So I chose her because she's a good interviewer who happened to be a course leader. But throughout the whole transcript, um, there was not really much reference to her context because it was more about me and my answers. Um, so I don't think they necessarily need to be insiders themselves. They just need to predominantly be experienced, comfortable interviewers that you are happy talking to. Um, I'm, I'm still figuring out how to, just to go back to Javina, I'm still quite figuring out how to exactly put this in my thesis. Um, I think once I've finished writing this methodological paper, I'll probably be a lot clearer on that um, because it is still a work in process. I'm at the moment um, I'm writing a, a vignette for the new um, um, a book by Burke uh, or Burks and um, whatever her name is, and there's a third edition coming out and they've in, in, invited some vignettes I'm submitting to that. And if they accept it, then that will be the first official confirmation that this is a new thing. Um, if not, in the end, from a grounded theory perspective, in its most basic, this is a really long memo, mm -hmm. really long memo. So even if everything goes horribly wrong, I will just use it as a really long memo. I'm planning on making it a chapter, but in effect, it's just a long memo. So that's how I see it. It fits grounded theory well, but I mean, it should also fit with, with other things because if you consider it, um, even if you're not mostly inside a researcher, but you're an outsider researcher, um, it's still valuable to explore your assumptions and, and thoughts on, on your, the, the environment that your participants sit in and the things that you ask them and the topic of interest and the topic of research. Mm -hmm. um, and I think people dismiss too early the notion that your personal, professional, educational experience affects your research full stop. Even as, I mean, even as a quantitative scientist, how good I am at a particular lab technique will affect my findings. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm fairly pragmatic with these things. Um, I'm also very aware that I will probably offend a lot of grounded theorists by saying these things out loud. Because they are a special bunch of people. So, um, yeah. Anyone else? Or are we all dazzled and now need a glass of wine? <laughs> well, uh, I don't know if, if Paulina, Paulina's mic is on. I'm not sure, uh, Paulina, if you have any uh, final thoughts. Uh, no, I, I was just, I was listening in. Um, thank you, Nikki, it was very, very helpful. I really enjoyed the talk. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering, will you share your slides? Yes, I'm going to put the slides on SlideShare and I'll send a link to that to Javina for sharing. Perfect. Uh, so sure. there'll, be, there'll be open access available to everyone. So okay. feel free to spread it to other people in your group that might yeah. not be able to be here tonight. Okay, perfect. That, that's appreciated. Thank you. So, so uh, Crystal, I don't, I don't want to be on the spot, but just welcome. I know you came in a bit late, but I put in the chat room that, that this is recorded. So thank do you, you have so much. Yeah, thank you so much. I was attending for a little one, so I got caught yeah. up with her. <laughs> yeah, no worries. But uh, yeah, uh, so yeah, absolutely, Nikki. I, I look forward to that. And uh, uh, I look forward to your presence in some of the workshops that ARU is uh, is providing uh, down the road. I'm a, mm -hmm. I'm a newbie at this. And so I have a feeling that, uh, you know, I, I will be knocking on your door. In fact, the next Grounded Theory Colloquium is going to be September. Right. I can't quite remember what the date is, but it will be out on social media. Um, it's going to be September somewhere. Yeah. So anyway, Martha, I'm sorry I interrupted you. That's okay. I, I just had a, a quick question. I, I love the, um, your kind of 
condensing of the questions that we might ask about trustworthiness and rigor and and how do you feel about sort of tweaking those questions to help us look at different methodologies or through a different methodological lens rather than grounded theory? Uh, as in that work, do you think? Probably, because in the end, grounded theory is a qualitative research. And the, the, the things that affect grounded theory when it comes to trustworthiness and rigor affect every qualitative project the same way because you are a person doing the research and you're standing with two legs in the research environment and you're coming into it with your baggage. And in the end, you still want to have findings and conclusions that are useful for your end user. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Martha, you could. Mm -hmm. uh, I was gonna just add and say, Martha, I hear you're saying, I really like the way you did that, Nikki, but. I, and I have to go back to the slides and see, but I felt like you were more general qualitative, um, qualitative spoken than grounded theory specific. Like the way you framed it, it, it seemed like you could apply it to any qualitative methodology. That, that was my understanding. When I read the, the way you framed it and the way you looked at it, it felt like I could take that and apply it within my study as long as it's qualitative work. Yeah, I mean, and it, it all depends on how you look at quality in, in qualitative research because obviously my, my preconception to that is that I'm a quantitative researcher and we're very rigorous about what quality means. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, there, there are so many different interpretations of quality. I've chosen a few that resonated with me as a researcher and amalgamated those into something that made sense to me. Okay. Um, and, and the same way, and, and I think that the questions as they're asked um, are fairly broad because in the end, as I said, grounded theory is just qualitative research. The same way IPA is, in the same way uh, um, thematic analysis is, in the same way the, the, all, all the others are. Um, so I don't see how, the, yeah, the questions can be tweaked and contextualized, but in, in essence, um, the, the concept of trustworthiness and rigor are qualitative research based not methodology based mm -hmm. um where do we find the citation for that that table uh, i'm waiting for the confirmation to come through for the preprint but there's a list of um a, a list of references on the lot i didn't show it because it's always a boring slide there's a list of references at the last slide of the presentation um so once you get the presentation you'll have the full list of citations oh perfect so it's in press right now uh, yeah, I'm waiting for the preprint to be released by the publisher. Um, okay. It's a preprint at the moment, and then hopefully at some point over the next couple of months, it'll be a, um, a final paper. Okay, beautiful. So All as right. and when that happens, I'll shout about it. Wonderful. So Nikki, thank you so much again uh, for You're your welcome. time and uh, and for for you know just your generosity in sharing your knowledge. And uh, I'm sure that. Uh, you know, I'm sure you won't mind us if any one of us has any questions, we would just pop an email and uh, and ask you. And You've, you've got my and, contact details. Yes. Um, there's a list of contact methods on the last slide. Um, all the resources are open access available. So okay. um, I'll make sure it's all there. Awesome. And, and good luck with your with your degree. Uh, I was going to ask you, you it, it's six years. Your program is six years. You're in uh, as a part-time researcher, it's six years. Oh, okay. As a full-time, it's four years. Okay. So so good luck with that. And uh, yes, and you all as well. Yes, thank for you. You guys, it takes a bit longer than it does for me, I think. So yeah. <laughs> uh, so on that note, I wish everybody uh, a good rest of the weekend. And Nikki, have a good night. Yes. Thank and you. Uh, so Crystal and we are hosting. Um,